to the narrative that I'm trying to make. Uh, we're going back to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. It reads, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Why was the word of the Lord rare? <clears throat> Why was the word of the Lord rare? It wasn't so much that the word itself was rare, which is this right here. It wasn't so much that this was rare or manuscripts was rare or text or, or copies of the word was rare. That wasn't the case. The word was rare because access to God was rare. Amen. Revelation isn't merely the word itself. When we speak of revelation, we're, we're speaking of understanding and clarity of the word. Amen. It's two different things. Many people can pick up this Bible and read it, but don't get revelation. Amen. So this is the case. It wasn't that the word was rare. It was that revelation was rare. Amen. Revelation is when the word becomes what? Alive. Amen. You ever been reading something for so long and you didn't have understanding? So it profited you nothing, right? It just kind of stayed on the page. You know, you, you, you might have read it multiple times. But until you got revelation, when revelation came, did you see how it impacted your life? How it became alive in you when that aha moment or that wow moment came when God revealed it to you. It became alive. Amen. So it, so it wasn't that the word itself was rare, right? When we're talking about manuscripts or even education of the word, that wasn't rare. What was rare was access to God himself. Amen. And, and, and we see evidence in this same passage. Amen. Uh, uh, and we're going to read uh, from verse 1 down to verse 7 when I find it. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3, uh, starting at verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 7. Amen. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Remember that. In verse 1, he's ministering to the Lord before Eli. Eli was a priest. Amen. Samuel was given to Eli uh, uh, to be dedicated to the Lord by his mother. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his bed and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, how many people know that the ark of God represented what? His presence, right? This is, he's in the house of the Lord. Samuel is in the house of the Lord. He's under the priest Eli. So Eli is what? Training him. He's educating him of the Lord, of the word. So he has education, right? So we're going to witness something right here. Uh, and while Samuel was lying down, verse 4, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, here am I. But at this time, he wasn't answering to the Lord because he did not know who called him. We see this in verse 5. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the, then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered. Eli answered again, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Look at this. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. Hmm, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. 
That is so interesting because so if this is true in verse 7, then how do we explain verse 1? If verse 7 is true, how do we explain verse 1 where we see Samuel ministering to the Lord before Eli? Right? But in verse 7, we see that Samuel had not yet had an experience with God. He had not yet known or entered into relationship with God. So what is the problem? What, what's going on right here? If this is true in verse 7, how do we explain verse 1? Samuel had the word. This is the answer. Samuel had the word, but he had not yet received an access to God. This is what we see because he ministered to the Lord before Eli. Eli was a priest. The child Samuel was given to Eli at birth because he, well, he rephrased that. He was given to God by his mother at birth. So here it is. Samuel was in training, right? So he had education of, of, on who God was. He had education on the word itself. But verse 7 reveals that Samuel had not yet had access. And what we see in this moment is that God is trying to grant Samuel what? Access. Look at that. First Samuel is in training. He has the word. But he does not yet know God. Right? So now God is granting him access. Right? Samuel had not. He had education of God but no experience. And we see that a lot today. We see people that's very educated of God, but have no experience of God. Right? They don't know him. God does not know them. But they are educated, right? They know of God. They may even reference God, but yet they have no access. Amen? Experience comes by way of access. And when you've had an encounter or you have experienced God, you now enter into relationship with God. You graduate. Now you graduate from knowing of God by way of education. You graduate from knowing of God by way of education to actually knowing God through experience. Two different things. You have a lot of people who haven't yet experienced God, and we know God works on his own timing. And we also know God chooses those who he called to Jesus as well, right? Which we're going to get into that later in this lesson, probably another day, right? So, so, so Samuel was in the transition from knowing of God to actually knowing him through an experience, because this is an experience to Samuel because God is calling him. He thinks it's Eli. This lets you know he don't know the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to finish this. I was going to start right there. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord revealed yet to him. That revealed is revelation. That's what we see in verse 1, that while the, the word was rare, it breaks down why it was rare, because revelation wasn't yet widespread. Not that revelation wasn't in the land. Everybody just didn't have it. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and said, here I am for you did call me. Then Eli figured it out. He was a priest. Eli knew the Lord. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and it shall be if he call you again, you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lie down in his place. Amen? Amen. So we see Samuel graduating or transitioning from knowing of God to actually knowing God. Right? An example of this uh, 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 is in Job. And we see this all throughout the Bible. And we even see this now. Right? Where people, I mean, faith comes by hearing. Right? Faith comes by hearing. 
But it's only until you receive access, which is what? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. That is until you're, that's what confirms you. So until then, you're not saved. You can hear the word, you can know the word, but until you receive access to God, which is through what? The Holy Ghost, you're not saved. God doesn't know you, and the word profits you nothing. Uh, let's go to Job. I want to further give an example of this, and it's probably the best, the best example the book of Job. Everyone is familiar with the story of Job. Uh, Job 42 and 5. And it reads, 42 and 5, my bad. And it reads, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Look at this. And we know the experience that Job had, right? God, God allowed Job to be tried. That was his experience because it, clearly he, he, he revealed it. He thought he knew God. He didn't. He knew of God. He was still an upright, righteous man, good man. But now God, God deemed it necessary that he give him access. He works on his timing. He wanted to take Job to the next level. So he did it through an experience. And he allowed all this turmoil to open in Job's life. All this turmoil. Job couldn't figure it out because he felt like he didn't deserve this. Even his friends felt like he didn't deserve this. And they told him to curse God. Well, God, God. God will give you an, an awkward experience. Most of the times when, when you have an experience with God, it's awkward. It's peculiar. Mm -hmm. Right? It don't make sense. Right? But when it was all said and done, when God had to get in his grill, you know how you had to tell your child, do you pay bills here? <laughs> Did you buy any food? Well, sit down somewhere. And that's what God had to tell Job. Was well, you with me when I aligned the star? in the skies. Was you with me when I said let there be light and there was light? Did you call anything into existence? Then don't you question me. And in that Job repented because his heart was pure. This is why God was giving him access because his heart was pure. But we, how many know, no matter how, how pure our hearts is, no matter how far we've gotten in the kingdom, there's further to go. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was trying to do with Job at the time. Amen. So we see this right here. After Job repented. Let me read all them. I, let, 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 me, let me do this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. This after he got in his grill. See, God will yield you, right? He'll humble you. I know you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who has counsel without knowledge? What he was saying is, you come questioning me and you don't have the knowledge. You come questioning me without knowledge. Because Job thought he didn't deserve this. I'm a upright man. This can't be happening to me. Therefore, I have uttered, look at this, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hold on, but if you go to the first chapter when it, when it introduces Job, Job, the uh, upright man who feared God, the greatest in the east or the west, wherever he was from, so well, you would think this man is a man that knew God, but right here we see he didn't. And the Bible teaches us that no one can fathom God. His knowledge is unsearchable. So even when you know him, you know him to a certain extent. It's, it's, it's much more to know that we, can't, we won't even know. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. That, therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Amen. 
So Job graduated from knowing of God by word of mouth, by ear, by education of him, through experiencing God, which is access. He gained access to God. Thus, he gained relationship. Amen. Uh, other examples, Moses, burning bush. That was an experience to Moses. He didn't, know, he didn't know what was going on. God spoke through that. God used that to get his attention. If you read the story, Moses was, Moses was walking, tending to the sheep or something, and he seen a burning bush. Then it says when God saw that the bush had his attention, read it. He spoke to him. So he was using a burning bush to get his attention because the burning bush was spectacular. How many know that's a revelation? It's something dynamic. Because Moses wanted to go to this burning bush and see why it wasn't burning. It was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And at that point, God saw he had his attention and he called Moses. An experience. He was now given... Moses' access. We don't see Moses having access to God before then. We don't see it. Right? Peter, the largest catch of his life in the daytime. He said, catch your net on the other side. Peter didn't know Jesus. He didn't know Jesus at all. He, that was the first encounter that he had with Jesus. And he said, cast your net on the other side. They was bringing their fishing equipment in for the day because they fished at night in those days. So it was foolish of Jesus to tell them to cast their nets in the daytime. But Peter did it at his word. After he told him, all right, Jesus, I know how to fish, but listen, you say it, I'm going to do it. He did, and he caught the largest catch of his life in the daytime. The five odds, dynamic. Peter left it and followed him. Experience, access. Paul thought he knew God. Saul, when he was Saul, he didn't know God. He knew God through the road of Damascus. That was his experience. God blinded him and knocked him off his horse. Look at that. God has some strange ways of giving us access. He gave me access in the jail cell. I thought I knew him. I grew up in church, read the Bible. Mama made me go up there and get prayed. Got all type of all laid on me, but I didn't know God. I experienced him while I was at my low. And I know God orchestrated that because he uses all things to the good of those who love him. Right? So it was in a jail cell, in the maximum security prison that I experienced him. Then I went from knowing of him to knowing him. Amen. Amen. So the word was rare because revelation wasn't yet widespread. Right? Widespread means e everywhere. It was here. People had revelation. Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It wasn't widespread. Everybody didn't have it. Amen. Um, the definition of revelation, a surprising and previously unknown fact, especially one that is made known in a dynamic way. What's more dynamic than a burning bush that ain't burning? <laughs> What's more dynamic than what Job went through to lose it all? Right? What's more dynamic than what Peter witnessed? Something defied the, all, the, 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 the laws of physics and nature. What's more dynamic than what Saul went through when he was blinded off his horse? Just to receive revelation, then giving his sight back. Yeah. It's one thing to be blind. You would have thought that was just nature. But he, he received it back once he received instruction from the Lord. And he yielded. Amen. Amen. Revelation comes through who? The Holy Spirit. That's who revelation comes through. Access to God gives us the ability to comprehend his word. See, that was the problem. They had the word. They just couldn't comprehend it. They couldn't learn it. They couldn't comprehend it, let alone obey it. Because they didn't have access. Because they didn't have the spirit of God. 
It is the spirit that enables us to understand this word as well as obey. It's the spirit, not us. We can't, we can't own up to nothing. It's none of us, zero of us, 100% God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We can't brag about nothing. He pursued us. We didn't pursue him. It's by faith, not by works. <laughs> it's a free gift. Our name was already written before time. In the Old Testament or days of old, God spoke through the prophets. Uh, the prophets had access to God, of course, because they were prophets. You can't do nothing godly without his spirit, right? These people who were prophet, major prophets, priests, they had the spirit of God. They had it. No one else didn't, and that was the problem, right? The problem was that Israel, though they were God's elect, they were still futile, alienated in their minds. So they could not receive, comprehend, let alone obey what the prophet said. That's why we see the up-down nature of Israel in the Old Testament. They was like some little animals, a little uh, mouse or something. They, one minute they obeying God, next minute they serving Baal, building idols and calves. And this is after now. I don't know, you know, I ain't nothing new under the sun. Yeah. But me personally, if you open the seat before me, you ain't got to show me nothing else. I, I ain't got to. I'm, I'm locked in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you split the Red Sea for me, if you make water come out of rock, if you rain manna from heaven, but it shows you Paul described this, uh, what you call it, phenomenon. He said, it ain't me, it's the sin that's in me. And that was the case with them. They were alienated still. God had to choose somebody for his redemption plan. He chose them. They weren't special. He had to choose somebody to orchestrate, to carry out the plan. He chose them, but they were still alienated because Jesus Christ, having yet came in the flesh and fulfilled the, the plan of salvation. So until then, God placed his spirit on whom he chose. So they, they were still futile in their minds. They could not comprehend what the prophets were saying, but the prophets still had to speak. But they couldn't get it. That's, that's why Moses was frustrated. And we see that because Moses was a shadow of who? Jesus Christ. We see that same frustration with Jesus, which we finna get to. I don't want to jump ahead of myself. Access to the word without access to God profits you nothing. And we see this. In the Bible, it's plain. Plenty of people had access to the word. They claimed they knew it, but they did not know it because they didn't know God. You got to know God to know the word because he grants you. It's him. It's not you. We are too futile in our being to even understand this alone, apart from him. So he has to come in you and make you understand it. Open your eyes. An example, as I stated, is Jesus Christ and his disciples. He, Jesus Christ, is the living word. Is God in the flesh, yet alone? He walked with the disciples. Day in, day out, slept, woke up, but they still couldn't comprehend. He said it. Over and over, we see the frustration with Jesus. Jesus is like, how long must I bear with you? Do you still not understand? All of these statements we constantly see, and this is Jesus. This is one of the persons of the Trinity. This is God. They had him, but they didn't have enough. Hear me out. Sound strange, but scripture reveals this. They didn't have enough because they didn't have understanding because Jesus is the word. He's the living word. He is the living word, right? They could not understand him, which is, you know, 
the, it, salvation was not yet complete. Jesus was, he was a, a, a puzzle. He was a, he was a puzzle piece. So the puzzle, the main one, but it wasn't fulfilled yet. It wasn't complete. That's why they didn't have understanding, because they had Jesus, but they was missing something. And very important, which is why they could not understand. And it's because of the Spirit of God wasn't yet poured out. That's what they was missing. They was missing the Spirit. That's why they couldn't understand Jesus, because he's the Word. He's the living Word. The Word of God without access to God, prophets, you that sounds crazy, but access is through his Spirit. It's through the Holy Ghost. It's his spirit. And I was so amazed when I was studying this because I'm going to go deep into this. I'm going to just kind of uh, drag out this lesson because I'm going to hit different points on the importance of the Holy Spirit as it relates to the plan of salvation and everything related to the kingdom. How he's really more involved than all the three persons of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is at work because he is the spirit of God, right? We see him at work from the beginning to the end and to now. So where that's what we have in us confirming us is Holy Ghost, right? So this is why he told them it was to their advantage that he leave. That's confirmation right there. Because people think, what you be? They had Jesus, Jesus is enough. Of course. But it's three persons to the Trinity, and all of them are equal. Because all of them are God. Jesus told him, this is Jesus himself. He told them, it is to your advantage that I leave and go back to the Father. Because until I leave, you ain't going to never get it. Amen. Because you, it, it, it's not enough for you to have me alone. We ain't talking about Jesus. We're talking about the word. He was the word. That's it. He was the living word coming in the flesh. John, in the beginning, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Later on, few scriptures down, and the word what? Became flesh and dwelled with man. So this is what Jesus is. We're looking at him as this. The living this. He said, I only say what my father has spoken. That's what he came as. Right? Let's go to John. Is this good? It was good to me as I was receiving it. Oh. John chapter 16 starting at verse 5. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me where are you going, but because I, I have said these things to you, sorrow has, filled your, sorrow has filled your heart. Because they didn't want Jesus to leave, because to them Jesus was everything. And rightly so. But Jesus said, no, it's more to come. <laughs> it's more to come, baby. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is verse 7, John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Notice he said the world and not just believers because the Holy Spirit is at work. Ooh, I don't want to jump ahead, but I got to drop this nugget. It is he that draws you because guess what? The, Jesus says no one can get to the Father except through me. But it's something before that. You can't get to Jesus except God draw you. And so it's the Holy Spirit drawing you. Before you even have knowledge of Jesus, the Spirit is drawing you to him. So you can't, you, it's none of you. I can't say I found Jesus. No, God sent you to him. He already placed the word in your heart. 
through his spirit. Jesus just connected with it. That's why some people get it fast. Some people never get it because it wasn't meant for them to get it because God know who his sheep is. He already called them. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. Conviction is good. Anybody get conviction? That's good. I'm glad I get conviction. That will let you know you're saved. That's what lets you know you're good or some good is in you that you acknowledge, man, I'm wrong. And you're yielding to conviction. That should have been the question, do we yield to conviction? <laughs> of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the rule of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you. Listen to this. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't bear the stuff I done told you already. So I'm wasting my time to even continue to talk to you. I got to leave so the spirit can come, so I'm going to talk to you through him, and you're going to get it. Because it's the spirit that's getting it, not you. He said, I have many things yet to say, but you can't bear them. You can't understand them. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. He. It's the spirit. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father, all Things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Amen. Let's jump back to John 14 and 16. John 14, starting at verse 16. And I will pray that the Father, I mean, I'm, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. That he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Verse 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. The Spirit, he will teach you all things. Not Jesus. Because you can't bear what Jesus say unless you got the Holy Spirit in you receiving what Jesus said. Right? It's too much. This is God. That's why he said we can't fathom God. Jesus is God, so we can't even begin to fathom. It's too heavy. Mm, I know it's good, but I just can't receive it. That's why we need the Holy Ghost to empower us. He will teach you all things and look and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Look at that. So the stuff I said to y'all that y'all couldn't receive, when you get the Holy Spirit, he's going to bring it back to your remembrance. You're going to be like, ah. that's what Jesus Christ was talking about. The moments ever came, the revelation came a little late. Amen. So with him, which is the Holy Spirit, we don't become God, but it's the God in us that's connecting with God himself, making us godly or godlike. We don't become him. There's nothing but one him. So we don't become him. That's why I got a problem with people talking about we little God. I ain't no little God. I ain't God at all. Muslims or uh, nation, yoke, peace, God. I'm not God. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I can be godly. I can be godlike because in the beginning we were created in his image, in his likeness. Right? So when we, when, so when we receive his spirit and are adopted in, we become once again godlike. Why? Because we got God in us. Amen? So in other words, sin took God out of us. 
But God put himself back in us by giving, him, by giving us his Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ, death on the cross, and resurrection from the grave. Mm -hmm. Amen. Sin took the godly all of us and made us normal, mm -hmm. basic. <laughs> God left us and we became basic. Then the plan of salvation manifested and he gave us his spirit and we became once again godly, godlike. Amen. And I'm closing. How many of y'all, um, I know y'all don't watch Transformers, mm -hmm. the movie Transformers. Well, Transformers, they're not human beings, they're robots. But they come from a different planet. They are not from Earth, so they are not from this world. They are not of this world. But they come to this world and they are supernatural, right? So to say. They are spectacular. But what makes them spectacular is something that comes from their world. And it's called the All-Star Chip. Right? This is what Decepticon, this is what he was trying to find. It was in the ice. One of them had crashed thousands of years ago and it was covered in ice and that's what they were trying to find because with that all-star chip from, that's from the planet that they are from, that's not of this earth, this basic earth, they come from a different planet. That's supernatural. They come from that planet and with that piece of technology from their planet, they can come to this planet and take what's basic and make it spectacular. Right? So the same way with the Holy Ghost. God says he's not of this world. Jesus said if I was of this world, if my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would be fighting that I would not be given over to your hands. But I'm not. Right? So God is not of this world, nor is his spirit. But his spirit has come to this world that's basic. Right? And when we receive what's of the spirit, we then become enhanced in our being. So we go from being basic to we enter into the supernatural. And it's not because of us, because we're of this world. But when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord, uh, as our Lord and Savior, and we receive his Holy Spirit, we are now enhanced by the spirit, right? And we now are no longer of a part of this world. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Mm -hmm. Amen? Was this lesson good to anybody? And like I said, I'm going to kind of, you know, drag this lesson out. You know, I might make it a, a series title because I got more in depth. I just didn't want to kind of cram it into one lesson. Amen? But there's uh, surely more to come. Amen? Let's give God a hand clap of praise.